Welcome to Ones and Twos Foreign Policies Economics Podcast. We take two different data points every week. We tell you how they explain the world. I'm Cameron Abadi, FP's deputy editor, joining you from Berlin, Germany. With us, as always, from his studio in New York is Adam Twos, FP's economics columnist. Hi, Adam. Hi, Cameron. Good to be back. Okay, so in just a bit, we're going to look at global food prices and try to explain why they've been going up very rapidly. But before we get there, let's start with this week's news data point. That's a big number, 195. It might be 197. Either way, it's the number of countries, technically speaking, UN sovereign states, that next week will be showing up at the COP26 climate conference in Glasgow, Scotland. It's also the total number of countries in the world. And that's no coincidence. Scientists say this year's summit is a pivotal moment for avoiding the most catastrophic impacts of climate change. The looming global climate talks have been described as the world's last chance to avert major climate destruction. The world has been unanimously participating in the UN Convention on Climate Change, which includes these annual meetings since the 1990s. The same goes for the Paris Agreement, which has been these conferences' most significant achievement. It's basically an agreement by the nations of the world to each do whatever is necessary to limit global warming to a total of 1.5 degrees Celsius. But current climate pledges aren't anywhere close to achieving this. Global emissions keep rising and they're going in the wrong direction. Of course, unanimity on the problem and unanimity on the goals, that's one thing. Now, agreeing on how exactly to get there is another. And so right now, the world is on pace in the best case scenario to experience 2.7 degrees Celsius of global warming. Dangerously off pace, in other words. Which brings us back to Glasgow. The point of next week's meeting seems to be to figure out how exactly to get back on track. Adam, I I suppose my first question is, again, as usual, a a basic one. Uh, What exactly happens at these climate change conferences anyway? I mean, we have hundreds of countries showing up. Are they all just sitting around a table? How should we be picturing how the work gets done? And what exactly gets produced at the end of it? Uh, They're staggering events. Uh, About 30,000 credentialed official delegates and hordes of NGOs that gather at the conference uh, meetings. The negotiations take place over two weeks. The first is the most technical and substantial week, which is, as it were, expert negotiators. And then in the second week, the ministers and the heads of government show up. Uh, Recently, we've established a pattern where almost all the heads of government or state attend. But now Xi and Putin have announced that, you know, Russia and China will not be doing that this year, which is a big blow to the standing of the conference and to the hosts, the UK in particular. I mean, what they do, and I mean, it's important just to understand the kind of basis for this. COP stands for the conference of the parties and the parties are the parties to the treaty, the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change that was signed in Rio in 1992. And things like the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, the IPCC, these powerhouse science reports that you know get a lot of media coverage, they all feed into this process. And then on top of that, you have treaties. So once upon a time, there was the Kyoto Protocol, and now there's the Paris Treaty layered on top. And the Paris Treaty then gives rise to another thing that breaks the headlines periodically, which are these NDCs, National Determined Contributions, which are the targets each country sets for itself with regard to emissions reductions, the two target dates, 2030 and 2050. And we've seen a lot of countries committing to net zero by 2050 and to 50% plus by 2030, all relative then to different benchmarks. In the US case, it's the early 2000s. So one issue that's at stake is whether the rich countries of the world will honour the commitment they made back in 2009 to raise at least $100 billion a year in funding for energy transition in the poorer countries. So far, they've fallen short. So in 2020, they missed the target and they only got to $80 billion. That's going to be on the agenda at Glasgow. Uh, If that sounds a little low, $100 billion for the whole developing world, it is. The IEA thinks it should be trillions per annum. And we're miles away from that, but that's all that could be agreed. An even more controversial issue are are reparations, in a sense. 
uh, damages to be paid by the rich countries which are responsible for global emissions to countries which are basically going to be swallowed up by the rising sea levels. Uh, that's absolutely toxic in political terms, but will no doubt come up and may help to logjam the Glasgow negotiations. So the way you're describing this kind of sounds like uh, the epitome of multilateralism. I mean, there's unanimous global participation. Everyone is formally equal. We have all of these scientific reports that are describing what needs to be done technically. Um, but I mean, how does all this intersect with real power politics? I mean, in reality, some of the countries that are showing up matter more in these negotiations than others, right? Yeah, they're a really fascinating arena uh, for geopolitics because having, you know, starting the way they did in the early 90s, they're to a degree at odds with the power politics of that moment, right? We think of the 1990s as maximum unipolarity, the moment of absolute American dominance. But here you have, um, you know, Rio, the meeting of all of the countries of the world negotiating over climate change when the United States has just led a global coalition to retake Kuwait from Saddam over what? Over oil, right? So it's always been somewhat at odds with the flow of power politics. And the question really is, how do you align the two things? I mean, the gears really started clashing already in the 1990s because COP1, which was held in Berlin in 1995, um, under the the chair of, of Angela Merkel, who was then Germany's environmental minister, they settled on this idea of differentiated responsibilities. So common but differentiated responsibilities. What that means is that the countries that signed this treaty all agree there is a climate problem, but then responsibility for dealing with it depends on your income level. And the principle that the Angela Merkel negotiated as chair and the Europeans recognized is that the rich countries should bear the burden of making the adjustment. The question of the last couple of years has been really how do you bind those big players into the story? And that's why Paris was so significant in 2015, because that's the first agreement in which everyone agrees to do whatever they nationally determine they're able to do, which means something. It doesn't have to be much, but it needs to be something. So India, for instance, doesn't target, target its total emissions. It targets the emission intensity of its economy, and it promises to bring that down. China is inched towards now making commitments on absolute emissions. I'm still having trouble picturing how this works, though, Adam. I mean, these climate conferences don't have any centralized body that can punish or threaten or cajole the participating countries that are showing up. So, I mean, what is the mechanism at the end of the day for getting these countries to make and hold their commitments? I mean, what's the mechanism for enforcement here? Is it all just a kind of peer pressure when they all show up every year? Well, it's, it's not entirely true to say that there's no enforcement mechanism. So the Kyoto treaties, which are, as it were, still legacy treaties, which are there in the system, they actually have an enforcement um, mechanism, an enforcement office indeed, that supervises the entire treaty. And the penalty is basically how you get treated within the so-called carbon trading system that was established in the early phases of these negotiations. The idea being that countries will trade entitlements back and forth. And the idea was that if you didn't meet certain criteria, you would have your allowances docked, you would have the stocks of carbon credits that you claimed docked. And they have, in fact, proceeded uh, to disciplinary action against countries like Ukraine and Kazakhstan for formalities, really, not having declared uh, their emissions. So it, it's there, but it, it does feel a little bit like the ghost of a, of a ghost right now. The, the main mechanism is peer pressure. Uh, that was the whole idea of the Paris Agreement. So get everyone to make their best bid, compile all of those bids, compare them, reveal how inadequate they are, then force everyone to be transparent about what they were doing, and then provide a mechanism for periodic review every five years or so, and then count on domestic political pressure and global public opinion to drive this. It's a kind of procedural ratchet effect. And that, I think, is, you know, has worked. I mean, if you, took, if you took the logic of this mechanism, you'd have to say that the glass is decidedly more than half full. I mean, 80% of the world economy is now covered by net zero pledges. The, the question, of course, is are the countries going to live up to their, their plans? In Europe right now, these treaties are 
are treated as law. Like they're absolutely binding on the governments in question. Any Western European government that pulled out of Paris would fall. And the German Constitutional Court has used Germany's Paris commitments and the carbon budget they imply to make rulings against the German government, basically saying, look, if you stick to your current plans, you will exhaust Germany's carbon budget by the early 2030s, and that will leave no room for future generations of Germans. And that's completely unfair, A, and B, it in fact violates your commitment, which is anchors the entire German constitution to preserve the freedom of German citizens, because they will lose the freedom to make decisions about climate policy. So this is beginning at the national level in countries with strong rule of law regimes to become really quite a significant constraint. I'm, I'm heartened by your optimism. You glass half full is, is, is actually a, heart, a heartening description of, of what's going on here. Um, more, than, more than half full, I think. <laughs> I think they'd want to insist, yeah. They'd want to say the, the procedure's working, yeah? Yeah, all via peer pressure. You know, that's, that's the old schoolyard uh, tactic of, of peer pressure can actually uh, uh, move the world's uh, uh, economies. I'll tell my five-year-old that next time he, he uh, comes home uh, feeling, feeling pressured by his friends. Uh, finally, a question uh, I wanted to focus on, on, on the economics of all of this. I mean, obviously, there's still basically a huge question about how all of the economies of the world can shift. Uh, in a relatively short time from being dependent on fossil fuels to clean and renewable energy and all the other things that that they would need to to stop global warming. I mean, the clock is ticking. Uh, I mean, you said you were optimistic. What gives you hope that it's possible to, to pull all this off? I think it's it's absolutely possible that the question is whether we'll do it. And I mean, economists, I think, think increasingly in terms of two basic mechanisms, uh, and one is is carbon pricing. You know, my friend Joe Stiglitz at, at Columbia is like the UN's pope of, of carbon pricing. And the idea would basically be to establish a global minimum carbon price below which the cost of emissions should not fall, and then progressively to raise that and to do various types of offset for low-income countries if necessary. That requires a lot of architecting, and it relies on the assumption that prices are enough to move patterns of supply and demand. And many people, I think, regard that as quite a tall order. Another, I think, to my mind, I find this much more calming as a way of thinking about this, is to say the problem basically consists of five bits, right? Electricity generation, transport, industry, housing, and agriculture. And at a first approximation, they're roughly the same size, like somewhere between 15 and 30% of the problem, depending on which country you're in, is each one of those five bits. And if you break it down that way, for electricity generation, the path ahead is really pretty obvious, right? We're going for renewables, we need better storage, perhaps hydrogen as an option, and then maybe, maybe, maybe nuclear as a backup for some countries. For transport, likewise, you know, the big bit, road transport, we've got a map ahead, right? We know how we're going to decarbonize that by the 2030s. And there are certain shipping companies like Maersk who are already making concerted moves there as well. Air transport, big technical issues, but it's a relatively small piece of the overall pie. Industry, you know, steel, cement, petrochemicals, they're all incredibly technically difficult. But these are also the most sophisticated players in the system. These are huge corporations with incredible incentives to act on this and huge R&D competence. And so it's a question of just finding the solutions in each case. When you take housing, the problem with that is not that it's super complicated. The problem with that is just bitty, 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 right? There are hundreds of millions of buildings that need insulating and better air conditioning and heat pumps and so on. But it really isn't a technical problem. And then lastly, there's food and agriculture, which is about 20% of the problem globally. And again, it's a matter of pure will. We know perfectly well what the, solu the at least first round solutions are, which is to move towards massively reducing the amount of meat we eat, and then as a secondary move, how much dairy we consume. So these are doable, right? When you break it down like that, all of a sudden it begins to seem like we've caught bits of the solutions in most cases. The scale of the investment is large, but we're not talking wartime. It's trillion, single digit, low single digit trillions per annum, which is what we need to be spending out of a global GDP of 80 trillion plus. And most of this is in fact growth, lifestyle and economically enhancing, right? We shouldn't think of this as a cost. We should be making what we're making as a better, more efficient, cleaner world. So it's really down to politics. It's about managing the interest groups, corralling the interest groups, constraining those which are really resistant, wrangling them to the ground, and boosting funding for key technologies that we don't have yet. It's, 
you know, when you put it in those terms, it, I think, becomes more manageable. Some people will say that's utopian and naive and there's you know, a whole bunch of things we haven't foreseen. And when you add it all up, it's just too big. But that, for me, is anyway how I, in my own head, keep it as a problem that doesn't just seem overwhelming and impossible. No, that's that's useful. Five sectors. I mean, you mentioned a, a pope of uh, carbon uh, pricing. Maybe we need a pope of each of them. I think a pope of housing, a pope of industry. <laughs> Maybe that may help market it all. But that is an optimistic, a heartening, I think, viewpoint. Uh, we're going to shift gears in the next segment to something that's a little uh, a little more troubling on the surface. That's the rise in global food prices. We'll talk about how bad it's getting. But first, we'll take a break. Welcome back to Ones and Twos. Okay, Adam, uh, let's get beyond the headlines. The next data point is something that's been getting a bit of attention lately. That's the number 33, as in 33%. That's how much higher global food prices were in September than they were just one year ago. That's what the UN has said. Some economists say that real food prices that's adjusted for inflation are higher now than at any point since the early 1970s. It's a food crisis that could become a humanitarian crisis and even in certain parts of the world, a political crisis. You've probably been noticing it when you go to the grocery store. Product shortages and widespread supply chain disruptions are really driving up how much people are paying at checkout. In New Delhi, India, Apoorv Sharma says his family members no longer go to the grocery store. Instead, they hunt out farmers markets. Adam, I want to ask a basic question about the data point. How do we calculate global food prices in the first place? I mean, I'm guessing this isn't just a matter of calling up supermarkets around the world and coming up with an average of the various items on their shelves, right? Yeah, this isn't supermarket prices at all. This is commodity market prices. So wheat, rice, beef traded globally in big uh, professional markets. Cereals, for instance, that's a 2.8 billion ton market annually. What's being reported are benchmark export prices. So these are producer rather than consumer prices. Now, obviously, the two are related, but they're related with lags and loads of intermediaries in the supply chain. Think of it as a sort of concertina or an accordion. And right now, consumer prices in the U.S. are rising only by about 3.8 percent of year on year, whereas farm prices in the U.S., which are closer to this U.N. number we're talking about, have risen by 20 percent since last year. And and there's the whole wholesale chain in between. So it's an indirect relationship. In fact, the FAO, the Food and Agriculture Organization Commodity Index, which is the one that's commonly cited, consists of 95 separate price quotations for 24 separate commodities, so beef, for instance, or wheat. And those are then grouped into five basic food groups, cereals, vegetable oils, sugar, milk, meat. And those are then pulled together using a weighting scheme. So you attach more weight to meat, which is so expensive, it accounts for 33% of this index and cereals are 29% and so on. But apart from that, as you were saying, the crucial thing is really what we're benchmarking food prices against. So the 33% number is relative to last year. But the other thing that really concerns us is how high are food prices relative to the price of other things. That's what's called a real terms increase in a price. So the price of the particular good, cars or computers or whatever that you're interested in, relative to all other prices. And the dramatic story that that you're referring to that's been going through the media is that food prices are higher in those terms, in real terms, than at any time since the early 70s. And the early 70s, folks who are old enough may remember, was a period of really serious global food crisis. This is the worst period in Calcutta, for instance. It's when uh, Mother Teresa became a global icon because there was famine in many parts of the poorest countries of the world. And that would, of course, therefore, if that's where we were back to, be very dramatic. But it turns out, and I've been doing some digging on this, that that finding depends on comparing food prices to the price of manufactured goods. And that makes a lot of sense if you think of this this number that we're talking about as a price for farmers. And what they want to do is to sell their corn to buy a computer. But the thing is that the price of computers and other manufactured goods has been falling. 
so that the comparison tends to exaggerate today's price spike relative to previous levels. That's how we end up with the conclusion that the prices that we're seeing right now are in real terms at the level of the 1970s. If you use a more general price index, what's called a GDP deflator, which includes a heavy weight for services whose prices have not fallen over time, like, say, the price of computers has, then the current food price spike is bad, seriously bad, but nowhere near the 1970s levels. Okay, so not as bad as the 1970s, but the 33% number, that is not uh, up for debate. That's one year comparison, and that's a pretty sizable yeah. increase. So what exactly is driving that surge? I mean, is this a blip? Or, I mean, when we're looking at the the increase in prices, are there longer term trends that, that we're really dealing with here? It's a really complicated picture. So the real average price of food set against other prices has actually been increasing for a while now, I mean, for decades since the year 2000. And that's reversing a previous period of decline. And part of the driver here is that population continues to increase. The rate of new land being brought into production is slowing. Plus, right now, we have rising fertilizer costs due to high energy prices. We have a surge in demand coming off the back of, of COVID. But what's really telling also about the current moment is that all prices do not move alike. So right now, rice is flat, for instance. Uh, the price of milk and dairy is also flat globally. Maize, on the other hand, uh, corn is sharply up because of export problems out of American ports as a result of damage due to hurricanes this summer. Oil seeds have surged, so palm oil from Malaysia due to what? Well, a shortage of migrant labor, which is again an effect of COVID. Soy has surged um, because China is rebuilding its swine herd after a cull that was forced on them by swine fever. It goes on. And sugar in Brazil um, is massively down the harvest because of a terrible drought. Um, plus, there's huge demand for ethanol right now as biofuel. Meanwhile, in the sugarcane refineries of Louisiana, uh, there's been a major disruption because of the hurricanes in the south of the US and drought has shriveled the sugar beet yields of the upper Midwest. So it's a combination of COVID itself, disruption of the labor supply system, a rebound in demand. And again and again, we see here climate change effects working their way through this entire system. Yeah, at some point, these kinds of natural disasters stop seeming uh, like random events. Um, but uh, are there economic effects downstream from this increase in food prices? I mean, if people are spending more on food, are they maybe spending less on other stuff? Could that have a broader economic impact? Yeah, it totally reshuffles the balance of the global economy. It generates winners and losers. So the total global food import bill, not what's paid domestically for food, but what's shipped across country lines is about $1.7 trillion. And that's up by about $200 billion from last year. So that's the transfer between countries. So this is good for food exporters, Brazil or Malaysia, for instance, but it's terrible for importers. And so in the Middle East, in North Africa, they get about 60% of their calories from outside the region. So if you're poor in North Africa, this is terrible news. In general, for low and middle income countries, it's, it's really tough. Um, they'll see their import bills for food rising from 560 billion to more like 730 billion. Poor countries, desperately poor countries like Lesotho or Mozambique have seen really serious depreciations of their currencies in terms of their ability to buy food in global markets. Closer to the United States, El Salvador faces an import bill for food which in 2020 came to over 80% of its foreign exchange reserves. So it's in real trouble. All told, UN agencies estimate that worldwide, between 720 and 811 million people face hunger last year and coming into this year as well. That's hundreds of millions more than we anticipated in 2019. About 3 billion people worldwide simply don't have the means to afford a healthy diet setting aside the question of whether they can feed themselves at all, and bringing that home to the US right now, in recent weeks, about 8.6% of the American population reported that in the previous week, they didn't have enough to eat at some point in the week. That's 28 million fellow Americans in this situation. That is a stunning scale of a crisis. Uh, it does beg the question of how it could possibly be solved. I, I, I wonder whether... 
uh, it's imaginable that entrepreneurs would sort of fill the gap here. I mean, uh, presumably there's a lot of money to be made uh, in figuring out how to make food more efficiently, more cheaply, it getting to people who need it. Is this a situation where producers of food are trying to innovate or do they know they're going to get paid anyway by the people who need food and they don't need to bother trying to innovate? Yeah, I mean, when we say producers, entrepreneur businesses in this context, right, I mean, we're talking about a hugely diverse mix of big agro businesses on the one end of the scale and tiny, small peasant farmers on the other hand. In Latin America, one of the major zones of global agricultural production, we're uh, expecting an expansion in cropland in use of about 5 million hectares over the next decade, which is a big headache environmentally. That transfer in land use is where a lot of the CO2 emissions for the South American countries come from. Elsewhere, the key is increasing yields and the intensity of production. And that takes inputs. That takes modern seeds, fertilizers. Those are all part of industrial supply chains, and they're expensive. And the problem is that they're really the greatest scope for really big increases worldwide in yields and productivity is in India and in sub-Saharan Africa, And the question there is really whether they can get the investment they need. The demand is there. The opportunity is there. It just takes that initial investment. There's a notional commitment on the part of African countries, African governments, the so-called Maputo Agreement, which requires them, commits them to investing 10% of public expenditure on agriculture and farms so as to ensure that this vital sector gets the priority that it needs. But they're very far away from actually achieving that. And so with global population heading from 7.8 billion today to 8.5 billion by 2030, the prospects are really for a gradual tightening of this balance and a steady increase in prices. To be absolutely honest, production increases might not really be our top priority because there's such horrendous waste in the global food chain that if we were able to optimize that in various ways, it would give us all of the increase in supply that we actually need. So I want to end with a historical question. Uh, And and that's if, Adam, do you know whether there's a strong link between accessibility of food and political stability? I mean, it reminds me of, on one hand, Marie Antoinette saying, you know, let them eat cake and that sort of being on the precipice of the French Revolution. I know the Arab Spring protests in 2011 were sparked by uh, uh, bread prices going up. I mean, is this a broader historical trend, food crisis leading to political crisis? I mean, it certainly is. If you think classically, say, of the Russian Revolution in 1917, it famously started with a bunch of very angry working class women in a bread line in in Petrograd in St. Petersburg. But you don't need to go back into the past. This year, 2021, we've seen food protests in several countries, Sudan, Lebanon, South Africa, Cuba all come to mind. They've all seen major protests. Now, all of those are also troubled countries. But what happens here is that food prices act as the spark, if you like. And an absolutely classic trigger is when governments uh, back away from subsidizing food. So to retain legitimacy, governments under pressure often buy food on world markets and then sell it at knockdown prices into domestic supply chains or they provide targeted assistance for food purchases. In the US, that's food stamps, right? So the US provides food stamps to 40 million people currently, uh, and that's going up under the Biden administration to cover these increased costs. But if you're a poor country and world prices are soaring as they are right now, then that subsidy gets more and more expensive. The gap between what you're getting back from your citizens when they pay for their food and what you're having to pay gets larger And at some point, you face the choice, either a fiscal crisis or a food crisis. And when then you decide to cut the subsidy, which several poor countries have been forced to do this year, then you get an outcry. So what for many of us just seems like an unalterable natural fact about the world and something we might notice but isn't really going to drive us to protest suddenly becomes acutely political. Well, there you have it. It sounds like we should all prepare for maybe some more political turbulence in the months ahead. Uh, But uh, we will leave that data point here right now. That will do it for today's Ones and Twos Foreign Policies Economics podcast. I'm Cameron Abadi. 
And I'm Adam Twos. Ones and Twos is written and produced by me, Cameron Abadi, along with Adam Twos, Rob Sachs, and Laura Rossbrow. Tell them, edit our episodes. If you want to learn more about what we're talking about, check out the links from today's podcast at our website, foreignpolicy.com, or follow us on Twitter. That's at Ones and Twos Pod. Those of you with episode ideas, we'd love to hear them. Tweet them at us or email us at podcasts at foreignpolicy.com. Already, we're receiving some great suggestions, like one from John McClelland. He's really interested in China, and he wants to know more about leverage that small and large economies have when it comes to things like trade, investment, and even hostage diplomacy. John, that's a pretty big question. I'm sure we'll be talking about China again soon, though. Uh, So stay tuned. And thanks for the idea. Keep the emails coming. Uh, we were definitely open to hearing more data points. Finally, if you like the show, make sure to subscribe to the podcast and write us a review. It really helps. Thanks, and we'll be back in your feed next week.